Revelation 7, 9. After this, I saw a vast crowd too great to count from every nation and tribe and people and language standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands and they were shouting with a great roar, Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. Praying through this uh, in the weeks leading, in the months leading up to our time together, um, God gave me some pictures. And as He speaks in pictures and words and impressions, I try to capture those things. So I'm going to risk a bit of transparency here and read to you from my own prayer journal about what God's been communicating regarding our time together. Now, this, of course, is not the same revelatory authority as the Bible. Um, but I think we're all learning a lot about to, how to hear from God. And we know that the voice of God is always consistent with Scripture, though it may extend beyond Scripture. And like many of you over these years, I've been on a journey of how to hear and discern that and distinguish that, what Dallas Willard calls the texture of God's voice. It's what John 10 is all about, when the Holy Spirit gently but clearly speaks. So I'm continuing learning how to put confidence in those words, impressions, pictures. So here's what I saw and heard when I listened on our behalf <coughs> for our time together. <coughs> Excuse me. I saw some scrolls rolled out. And one of the scrolls, it was labeled Ridgecrest. It was tied up with a gray ribbon. No idea why. The top of the scroll was written the words rest. And under that, it said, don't strive. Let the anointing flow from heaven, not from any of your efforts to motivate, to inspire, to exhort. Just let the blessing and the presence and the unction flow. No striving, no pressure. Because you and all of those in the room reflect my heart for the nations, says the Lord. I, the Lord, want to give you the nations. You know what to do so that my good news can flow. Don't be deterred. You've got the know-how, the processes, you have the anointing, and you have the mandate. Live into it with enthusiasm. You are part of my solution to the frightening statistic about a world that continues to explode in numbers and the unreached and unengaged percentage that continues to grow. And I, the Lord, intend to bless you. You and your week together because it is so close to my heart. And I want to give you a taste 
just a taste of what that Revelation 7-9 scene will look like when it's played out in the heavenlies. At the culmination and the consummation of the age, it's a piece of the kingdom breaking in now because that is the vision that you are honoring and anticipating. I want to bring a part of that into being for all of you who are gathered. Bless and encourage. Speak prophetically as you hear from me. The more that you and CRMUS, Novo, and Conex partners give out and give away the more I will give to you. No need to force it, no need to push or manipulate anything because my power will be evident when you gather. No one's got to work at it. Be present because of the prayer that has been invested, because of the longing evidenced because I want to take pleasure in these dear people. My sons and my daughters. My family. My people. Let my glory rest. And rest in my glory. And then... I got a glimpse of Ridgecrest. This place, and it seems like there was rain, rain dropping on it. <laughs> yeah. Rain dropping on it. But it's, it's different. It's a, it's a heavenly rain. It's, it's not water. But it's droplets that are gold in color. Blessing from heaven. <laughs> Amen. Couldn't said it better. And the angelic are surrounding the place and they're delighted and amazed at the divine manifestation. Soaking in the pleasure of God. So my brothers and sisters, that's what I sense we will see and experience. I've already begun to taste this week. Perhaps not the actual picture, but the presence and awesome sense of blessing that will descend. I expect that's going to happen informally and relationally, and we're going to make space and time for it every evening in the plenaries. After the formal part is done, we'll have what we call more, which is extended time of worship, ministry, time to one another, and prayer. There's three things this week you're going to hear over and over and over again. One is, what is it that God has called us to do? He's called us to do his movements of the gospel in every nation. And you hear a lot about, secondly, how do we do that? Distinctives that God's entrusted to us who we are, and how he expects us to minister in word and in deed and in power. Intimately related to Jesus with ever-growing supernatural fluency in a culture of blessing and of honor across generations 
in gender and culture. Going boldly as catalysts, pioneers, and sent ones. Selecting and mobilizing and releasing visionary leaders, collaboratively working together because none of us on our own has the total picture. And with a clear focus on the results and outcomes of a tremendous freedom to experiment, to try, to be creative, to enculturate, to thrive, and to soar. But above all that, I want to continually draw us back to a higher purpose. More than what we do, more than how we do it, a greater design, an ultimacy that is at the very heart of the mission of God and is biblically the priority within the mission of God. That's the third thing, and that's why we do what we do. It's for the eternal worship of Jesus among the nations. Among all the peoples of the earth. And the scope of that why is beyond comprehension. It's vast. It is, as Revelation 7, 9 says, too great too huge to count. The inflammation of God's worldwide purpose is clear. He aims to be worshipped by disciples of every nation, every tribe, every tongue, and every people. And we are called to participate. That's why we do what we do. I first met Ronnie Stevens in 1987. We'd launched ministry uh, the year before behind the Iron Curtain to Eastern Europe, which was CRM US's first foray into cross-cultural or international work. And one of our primary teams was based in those years in Munich, what was then West Germany. Now our staff there in Munich had come across a small fellowship of believers, the Munich International Church where Ronnie Stevens was the pastor. Didn't take us long to realize we'd struck gold, hidden gold far away from the glitz and the cult of personality so characteristic of North American pulpits, we discovered a person who I believe in our generations, is one of our generation's premier expositors of the Bible. In the grand communication tradition of Whitfield, Wesley, Moody, Simeon, Chesterton and Spurgeon. My first visual recollection of Ronnie was in Berkish Garden, Germany in 1988, exactly 30 years ago. Ronnie was standing in a room speaking to us with an open Bible in the very same spot 50 years earlier Adolf Hitler had stood surrounded by the Nazi hierarchy. I saw the actual pictures in the hotel lobby, the stunning vistas of the Bavarian Alps in the background, and here Hitler is, and here we are 50 years later, you remember that, standing right there. Same furniture, same drapes, same scenery. Where great evil had prevailed, we heard the good news of Jesus. 
proclaimed with great power. Look, some of you are in difficult situations today, not unlike the demonic, systemic evil that Hitler perpetuated. Some of you are in cultures that are oppressive or disintegrating. You may be in Venezuela or Bangladesh or Iraq or Sudan or Russia or Central Asia or Nigeria or the United States. Despite the evil, the lesson is this. Jesus will reign. Jesus will reign. Jesus will reign. As Corrie Ten Boom said about her horrific experience in a Nazi prison camp, no pit is so deep that he is not deeper still. Jesus' light is greater and stronger than the deepest darkness. Since then, Ronnie Stevens has repeatedly ministered over the years to our staff in conferences and in multiple settings in Eastern Europe, in Hungary, in Romania, in Greece, at various collective gatherings, here in the United States at staff conferences, and more broadly to national leaders throughout countless settings and for countless organizations. Always quietly, under the radar, with great grace, intellectual acuity, humility, and powerful spiritual authority. So when we thought about somebody who could take this passage and this theme and drive it home for us to start this week, Ronnie Stevens was at the top of our list. So we are deeply privileged to have him here. Come on up here. He leaves tomorrow. He leaves tomorrow with his wife, Jane, to return to Moscow, where they live and where they minister. But we got him for the day. So, Rodney, in the name of Jesus, we now ask for the Spirit of God, through the Word of God, to speak, to bless you with exactly what God gives you for us. In the name of the Father, and of Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So I had my word of greeting to those you've already heard in the precious and beautiful name of the desire of the nations, God's only Son, Earth's only Savior, Jesus Christ our Lord. I'm very happy to worship the living God, through his only son with you this evening at Ridgecrest. While you're turning to Revelation 7, I uh, just want you to know that it's hard for me not to be jealous of you. I mean, I wish I could change my name. Um, <laughs> I mean, really, after almost 68 years, i got to tell you, Ronnie wears thin. It's very 50s, you know. Why couldn't it be something romantic, European? Why couldn't it be Sebastian? And you know, in the South, we're very content to indelibly label creatures who will one day be grown men with the names of little boys. And, uh, 
And you just keep calling them that forever, even when they're 99 years old. That's why Billy Graham was from North Carolina. So. <laughs> and Jimmy Carter's in his 90s. You remember President Jimmy, don't you, from, from Georgia? And, and uh, you know, as Southerners talk like this just to keep our opponents overconfident. It's a great joy to be with you and, and to see the consecration of your lives toward what you do. And I hope you'll be doing it until you get into this room we're going to talk about tonight. We're bidden to hear the speaking voice of God. That's what we've been asked to do. You know, the hymn writers, they make similar exhortations to us. I was thinking about a hymn when I was looking at this verse. Hark, listen, how the heavenly anthem drowns, all music but its own. Ever think about the music that will be in that room? When we were together in Athens, I think eight years ago. Was it eight years ago? Six years ago, we talked about John 1, and we, we talked about how Andrew and John, who doesn't name himself, they hear John the Baptist say, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And they, they peel off from that discipleship group, and they begin to follow the Lord Jesus, and they walk a little while, and Jesus stops, and he turns around, and he looks at them. And he says, what do you guys want? And they said, we just want to see where you live. And that's one of the reasons I became a Christian. I just want to see where he lives. And in this passage, which has been chosen for us as a theme... Uh, we see where he lives. And we see who's going to be there. And so not only, not only has the text been chosen for me tonight, but a phrase in the text, at least from the New Living Translation, too great to count has been chosen. So let's look at the text, shall we? We are bidden to look. I'm going to do something that may have never been done before at a CRM conference. I'm going to read the text from the authorized version. <laughs> After this I beheld, I saw something, and lo, that means you look too. A great multitude, which no man could number, paraphrased, too great to count. That's our thing, too great to count. A number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. I want to take the first I want to take the last phrase first. May I do that? This is the fulfillment of the beatitude promise. Clothed with white robes, that's purity. Clothed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. The sixth beatitude. Blessed are the pure. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. What are they doing in that room? They're seeing God. And then they've, they've been made pure. 
not with an intrinsic native purity, not with a righteousness their, no, their own, but with an imputed and now imparted righteousness of the impeccable Jesus. Palms in their hands, that's peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. When I was last in London, I went to church across the way from Buckingham Palace, Christ Church Mayfair. Fantastic church. I know many of you are often in London. I go to that church and go in the evening. It's better in the evening over behind the Park Lane. And I saw Buckingham Palace from a distance. But where the royal monarch sits, whether it's in Buckingham or Windsor or Balmoral or Holyrood, I cannot approach. But her children can. And these are the peacemakers who are the children of God. And they are before the throne. Lo, I saw a great multitude which no man could number. Too great to count. Now that's what we're going to talk about. Because that's what we're supposed to talk about. what we see is an exhibition of the fruit of the work of Christ. A multitude too great to count. And when we think of the, the work of Christ, we shouldn't be surprised that the work of Christ is too great to measure. Because the person of God and Christ is too great to count, too great to measure. We cannot number him. His person is incalculable. No one can number the mystery of his personality because he's three in one. And he's one in three, a stumbling block to the Unitarians, a stumbling block to the Jehovah's Witnesses. A stumbling block to the Muslims. But why should God conform to our mathematics? He's not within our system. He's outside our system. Shakespeare doesn't have to be murderous like Macbeth. He's not in the play. He doesn't have to be hesitant and full of agony like Hamlet. He's the playwright. He can make them any way he wants, but he doesn't have to be like them in any way. Donald Carson, whose brain has a brain, this amazing Cambridge scholar who teaches at Trinity, you know he wrote a book on Greek accent marks? <laughs> can you imagine that? Greek accent marks. When I met him, I told him I was waiting on the movie. <laughs> when he was an undergraduate at McGill in Montreal, the, the Canadian Harvard, he um, made friends with a graduate student in math who was a Muslim. And Professor Carson studied math and chemistry as an undergraduate. He's one of these Renaissance men. He rebuilds his own transmission. It's true. He can do anything. And, uh, and the, the man began to taunt him. And one day, sitting at the table, the, the Arab mathematician said, okay, we've got a teacup here. That's one cup, right? Right. And we've got a second teacup here. That, that's two cups, right? We've got a... Th we got a third teacup here, right? 
Right. So, so how many teacups we got? Don Carson said, well, three. He said, okay, now God the Father is God, right? Right. God the, God the Son is right, right? Right. God the Holy Spirit is God, right? Right. Now, now how many gods do we have? You know what Don Carson said? Well, now, if you've got one infinity and a second infinity and a third infinite person, how many infinities do you have? His person is too great to count, according to our mathematics. The length of his life is too great to count. No one in this room can imagine eternity. We, we can convince ourselves that we can imagine a reality which has no end, but none of us can imagine a reality which has no beginning. We simply cannot imagine any reality, any noun that cannot be modified by the word before. And yet you can't say before God. Gerhard Voss, the great Dutch theologian who died in 1949, while expounding Jeremiah 31.3, Behold, I have loved you with an everlasting love, and therefore with cords of compassion I've drawn you. Professor Voss said, remember, eternity goes in both directions. It doesn't just go forward, it goes backwards. One reason I know that God will never stop loving me is because he never began. You go trillion Times a trillion years into the past, God is not young. God's eternal. God does not have a black beard in eternity past. You go a trillion times a trillion years into the future. God is not old. God's eternal. God does not have a white beard in eternity future. No man can number the length of God's life. It's incalculable. It's immeasurable. No one can measure the breadth of God's love. And that's what we need to talk about a minute when we talk about the phrase within Revelation 7 9, which is our theme for the conference. This business of something that is too great to count. Christ's love is too great to count. And there's an irony and a paradox in that God set his love on the Jews. And and the irony is because he set his love on the Jews, and he did. In Christ's generation, it was impossible for the Jews to believe that he set his love on anybody else. They were praising Jesus in the synagogue in Nazareth until he reminded them that there were lots of starving widows in Israel in the generation of Elijah. But it was a Phoenician woman, a Sidonian whom Elijah brought the relief to. And the problem in Israel in that generation was a Phoenician woman named Jezebel. God had mercy on another Phoenician woman, not on a Jewish widow who was starving. And in the next generation, there were many lepers in Israel, but Elisha healed a Syrian general who threatened the security of Israel, named Naaman. And go back and look at Luke 4. They were praising him until he said that. When he said that, and all he did was he told them what was in the Bible. They tried to kill him. There's no record that he ever went back to Nazareth.
from the call of Abram in Genesis 12 to Revelation 22, the whole Bible is essentially about one man's family. The man called Abraham. And yet we learn from Galatians 3 and in other places that when we trust great Abraham's greater son, we each become a member of God's family and part of a multitude which is too great to number. And so we see around this throne representatives from all the goyim, all the ethne, all the nations, all the families, all the people, all the languages, standing before the throne. You know how the last chapter ends? It ends with a question. Who shall be able to stand? You know how the chapter before that ends? It ends with a reference to the 20 elders who fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. So who shall be able to stand? Those who fall down. Those who fall down and worship him shall be able to stand before the throne. Who shall not be able to stand in the day of God's wrath? Those who refuse to fall down and worship this crucified throne sitter called Jesus of Nazareth. And here they are, the redeemed of all nations, standing in the place where God lives, beholding the Lamb, sitting on the throne of God. Now, only very recently, I, I've become almost obsessed with something very obvious, but I missed it for almost all my life, and that is this. Almost everything Jesus said and did was counterintuitive. And we don't notice it. You know why we don't notice it? Because we know the stories. Many of us were blessed to grow up in places where we were taught about the life and work of Jesus. And therefore, nothing shocks us because we know what's going to happen next. And it's like that in the whole Bible. We're not worried when they're pinned between the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army, are we? We're not worried when Paul is shipwrecked at the end of Acts, are we? Because we know how the story ends. Well, what about the people who were there? They didn't know how the story ended. Joseph didn't know he was going to get out of prison. And the people who first heard Jesus speak, who watched what he did and heard what he said, were shocked out of their minds. Because almost everything he said and did was totally counterintuitive. By counterintuitive, I mean Isaiah 55. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. By counterintuitive means he did the opposite of what we would have done. He said the opposite of what we would have said, especially what a Jew of the first century would have said or done. Let me give you an example of what I mean by counterintuitive. In John 9, there's a man born blind. Jesus is going to help him to see. What does he do? He, rub, he rubs mud in his eye. That's pretty counterintuitive, isn't it? Wouldn't you have done that? You're trying to help somebody see. Wouldn't you rub mud in their eyes? You see what, what I'm... You know why Jesus was counterintuitive? Because his father was counterintuitive. You want, to know how, you want to know how his father was counterintuitive? My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. What, what military counselor tells a general, you know, you can't win this battle because you've got too many soldiers. So he calls the force. You still got too many soldiers. That's pretty counterintuitive, isn't it? Now, there are two reasons 
this business of counterintuition is relevant to this passage. One reason is because there's a lamb on the throne. Lambs don't sit on thrones. Lambs are tied to altars. In Revelation 5, John is told to look at the lion. And he looks to the lion and he sees a lamb. I don't know. I, I don't know if um, somebody remembered to prepare only one quote for the PowerPoint. I wonder if we have it. It's a quote from Jonathan Edwards. This is my favorite phrase in the writings of the greatest man ever to stand in a North American pulpit. We have to say North American because the United States was yet unborn. Edwards died in 1755. This quote comes from a sermon on Revelation 5, the throne vision. And what Edwards is talking about is how do you combine a lion with a lamb? Some of you will know something of the iconography of Hinduism. Chesterton said when you look at those images, they are terrible enough to crack the sky like a mirror. And the images of of Hindu worship combine unlike creatures. One of the most famous is a god with the head of an elephant and the torso of a man. You will have seen it. And yet, when God combines realities, the outcome is not grotesque. It's beautiful. Now, if you were to to imagine, apart from Holy Scripture and apart from the knowledge of who Jesus is, the combination of a lion and a lamb, you would only be able to think of something grotesque. But Edwards insists it's not grotesque, it's beautiful. Here we have the admirable conjunction, the joining, the combination of diverse excellencies. The excellence, there's a real excellency in a lamb, and there's a, a real excellency in a lion, but they are different excellencies. They are diverse excellencies. But the conjunction is admirable, it's beautiful. When we see the fusion of a lion and a lamb in the man Christ Jesus. And this is the beauty that they behold in this place. But it's totally counterintuitive. No one would ever think to combine a lion and a lamb, and no invented God, a God who is created but cannot himself create, could ever have imagined a reality that was shocking and yet at the same time beautiful as the man Christ Jesus who is a lion and who is a lamb. Now, there's something else counterintuitive in this room, and it centers again on the phrase which we're to focus upon. And it is in the diverse origins of the people in the room. Their destination is the same. Their origin is quite different. Let me, t- let me show you how that's counterintuitive. The Jews could never shake this ethnocentricity, this insistence that they be first and foremost. When they, when they realized Jesus wasn't going to throw the Romans out, but that's what Barabbas wanted to do, they killed Jesus and let Barabbas go free. Think of it. Think of a Savior who comes to a culture like that. 
The Jews hated the Gentiles. The first thing Jesus does after the Sermon on the Mount, ending in chapter 7, is in chapter 8, he points out a Roman centurion. And he says, no Jew has as much faith as he does. Think of that. Think of that as an evangelistic strategy in that culture. There was a group of people that the Jews hated more than the Gentiles, and that was the Samaritans. We talked about this at Mount Hermon in 1988 in John 4. Do you realize that when Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, she said, you know, we're expecting the Messiah around here, you know. He said, I who speak to you, ego a me. I who speak to you am he. You know what that was? That was the fullest self-disclosure of the messianic identity in the Bible. The only thing that comes close is Matthew 16, Caesarea Philippi. And some would say that's, that would be something as dramatic. I, I, I've got to give the nod to John 4. The Jews looked down on the Samaritans. The Samaritans looked down on Jewish women, on Samaritan women. Uh, this woman was at the well at high noon. Women didn't go to the well at noon. This woman was at the well alone. Uh, alone. Women don't go to the well alone. Why was she at the well alone at, at noon? Because nobody would be with her. She was looked down upon by the Samaritan women. She was the lowest of the low. Quoting from the Talmud, compiled after Jesus' generation, but reflecting rabbinic attitudes in the generation Jesus lived in. First quote from the Talmud, better to burn the law than to teach it to a woman. Second quote from the Talmud, he who teaches the law to his daughter plays the fool. Third quote from the Talmud, do not speak to a woman in public, no, not even to your own wife. Fullest self-disclosure of the messianic identity in the Bible. You think that was made up? You think they made that up to try to win friends and influence people among the Jews? <laughs> there's, a, there's a double apologetic here. Not just that it could not have been made up. We're going to talk about that in a minute. We're going to end on that, that thing. But you know, we're facing a generation who believes that the Bible is, is not into social justice. That the Bible is, in fact, racist. Just because God chose the Jews, that's one reason. God's love is discriminating. We're going to talk about, I mean, he does choose the Jews. He does favor Isaac over Ishmael. He does favor Jacob over Esau. And no denying that. You don't need to run away from that. How could a man who came to be the king of the Jews and to save his own people make up a story? One of the three most famous stories in the history of the world. A story where a Jewish priest and a Jewish scribe are the villains. And a Samaritan is the hero. <laughs> you, think, you think the scripture's racist? You know, we have, we have gone through the most amazing metamorphosis in terms of taboos and scandal, even in my lifetime. When I was born, a person could not admit homosexuality and expect a survivable scenario in terms of his future and career in most professions. Now, in most of the public arena, a person cannot 
call that orientation sinful and ex have a reasonable expectation of a, a successful public career. And in my generation, and by the way, this is a, a, the generation I was born in, and this is a, a huge improvement. A person could tell racial slurs every day and be a hail fellow well met in, in every segment of ruling society in this country. You get caught vocalizing a racial slur in 2018, you're finished. You're absolutely finished. Here's a man who came to save all tongues and tribes and nations. Here's a man who loved the Samaritans, who loved the Gentiles, who loved all races. And he brings them before the throne by the purchase of his own blood. What kind of man is this in the first century? In the 20th century, we have been racist. In the, 20, in the first century, here is the lover of races because he is the creator of races. God loves diversity. Remember, he's Trinitarian and he's measureless. When we come to this passage, we see that these people are in this room because of the gospel. In the room they cry with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. It's our job to convince the nations of the truth of the gospel. People from radically different religious perspectives. People who think that to believe the gospel is to betray my family. People who think that to believe the gospel is to become a traitor to my country. Christianity is not a Western religion. It's not even a Mideastern religion. It's a heavenly religion. It's something born of God, and it's something God died for. If the gospel had been made up, it would have been made up in a different way. If the gospel were a conspiracy, it would have been proclaimed with a different strategy. There was one group of people that the Jews hated more than the Samaritans. Samaritans couldn't help it that they were Samaritans. And that group of people were the tax collectors. They could help it, but they loved money more than their nation. One of the first things Jesus ever did publicly is he called a tax collector sitting in his office and said, you're going to be my friend. I'm going to be your mentor. You come live with me. No one would even go to a, a tax collector's home. Jesus went to their parties. Tax collectors were like vultures who will eat anything, but nothing will eat a vulture. Nobody else would come to a party with tax collectors except other tax collectors. And Jesus! That's one of the first things he did. One of the last things he did, he's on his way to Jerusalem. He goes through Jericho. He stops under a tree. He looks up and says, I'm going home with you. He did it publicly. Zacchaeus is my friend. And in a few minutes, Zacchaeus is saved. I'm going to his house. He's going to come to my house. He's going to be in this room. I mentioned, if it were a conspiracy, the strategy would have been different. Can you imagine the apostles? And by the way, for the last 150 years, scholars have believed that Mark was written first, but there's a growing consensus that Matthew was actually written first, just like the canonical order. It's not a majority yet, but a surprising number of scholars are concluding that Matthew was written first. But no matter when it was written, can you imagine the apostles conspiring to foist a fable and a lie onto Israel and saying, well, Matthew, 
you're a tax collector. Why don't you write the first gospel to the Jews? (laughs) That would be impossible. (laughs) Absolutely impossible. If the gospel were made up, it would be made up differently. But let me tell you something. The gospel could not have been made up. Because the gospel could not have been imagined. You cannot make up that which you cannot imagine. You cannot invent that which you cannot conceive. I'm going to prove to you that the gospel could not have been imagined. See, we don't notice this because we've heard the gospel all our lives. Just like the counterintuitive things Jesus did and said, don't shock us because we know what he's going to do. We know he's going to look at a man who has every advantage of birth and say, the only thing you need is another birth. We know he's going to look at a woman whom no one will go near and say to her, let me put my mouth where you put your mouth. Let me have a drink out of your cup. So it doesn't shock us because we've known the story all of our lives. And most of us have heard the gospel all our lives. So it doesn't shock us. Well, let me show you how shocking it is. And let me show you that it's unimaginable. The gospel could not have been invented because the gospel is unimaginable. Think of one of the empires which occupied Israel. Think of the Assyrians or their successor empire, the Babylonians, or their successor empire, the Persians, or their successor empire, the Greeks, or their successor empire, the Romans. And think of an emperor over one of those great empires. And he calls his commanders together because there's been a rebellion. So the emperor calls a council of war. And the august and fearsome commanders enter the throne room, enter the presence of the emperor. And they sit and take counsel together. And the emperor says, gentlemen, uh, in a distant province, there's been a rebellion. And the citizens of that province have abused our representatives. They've killed our garrisons. They've murdered our ambassador. What shall we do, gentlemen? Speak. A hand goes up. Speak, general. Sire, I know. Let's send your only son and heir, unarmed into the enemy camp, where they will abuse him, mock him, and Torture him to death slowly. Then those rebels will know how much we love them. Now that never happened, did it? And if if it had happened, you could measure the life of that bright-eyed general, not in minutes, not in minutes, but in seconds. You could measure his life in seconds. You know why that could not have happened in history? Because it could not have been thought of on this planet, could it? The most imaginative writer of fiction could never think of such an unlikely, impossible scenario. It's not a human thought. It could not have happened because it's not a human thought. But it did happen, didn't it? And it wasn't a human thought. It was a divine thought. And it didn't originate on this planet. It originated in heaven. It's a way to take the miserable rebels in this place to that place
where the crowns are cast down and the ransomed worshipped. Those among the great multitude, too great to count, no one could number, the redeemed of all nations, kindreds, people, and tongues, who stood before the throne and before the Lamb. Go find those potential worshipers. Go convince them of this unimaginable, uncreated gospel and bring them with you to that room. Amen.